Hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to be doing a bit of a discussion on the topic of uh, central planning versus free markets. And today I'm joined by, introduce yourself. Hello, I am Elias. On this server I'm named Tanky. I am a Marxist-Leninist. Uh, makes me a communist and I'll be basically arguing for plant economy. And I'll be, of course, doing why I do not believe a planned economy will be successful. So anyways, uh, did you want to do an opening statement? Yeah, uh, not that organized or anything, but... Um, oh, that's fine. I guess, uh, despite my being a Marxist-Leninist, and despite the fact that I probably would argue in favor of past socialist states that have had the you know, Marxist-Leninist model of like a very strong bureaucratic planning system, um, the reality is, and most communists would agree, that a planned economy does not have to take the form of like a very strong planning agency planning like a, a nationwide economy with like five-year plans etc i'd argue that that's just a, a reality of the situation um so a planned economy the first misconception i would get out of people's heads is that it has to be some kind of quote-unquote tyrannical state structure that is like controlling every aspect of life or whatever um, a planned economy can just as easily be on a local scale and it can just as easily be done in late stage communism which is stateless and classless and moneyless so um the reason i support a planned economy in both the low stage socialism like what the soviet union had and end stage communism is largely based on priorities which is where a lot of these discussions i guess get hung up on um so my priorities are in the beginning obviously like being that i'm a communist sort of worker control of everything but in the end i would like common ownership of production um, but on a more empirical and objective level, I believe that planned economies are much more efficient in dealing with production. They're much more beneficial to the average consumer of goods and services. Um, and yeah, there's really not a lot more to say. I guess I could get into evidence when we actually like discuss the topic, but I don't think I have much more to add. All right. So I was just going to respond to that real quick. Like first off, just trying to clarify a few terms. So you said like <laughs> local planning, like how does that work? Like who's going to be doing the planning? How much power will they have? How is it that, or why are people going to want to listen to them? Sure, I mean, largely depends on the location. I can't give you an exact model that would work everywhere, but on a very broad scale, um, I would argue that on a localized production, it would look more like, um, if you're talking, I think you're talking about what I was alluding to with like kind of the commune situation where you have like end stage communism type deal. Uh, and at that point, we assume by the nature of communism that we have abolished the state because of its um because of it not being necessary anymore that's the whole marxist concept of the withering away of the state that the state goes away when the state is unnecessary and so if we're at a point where the state is no longer there people are automatically uh cooperating and achieving communism on their own without any need of coercion and so people essentially are planning production because they can measure the needs of society through whatever means are available and we already have them now there's plenty of algorithms out there that measure and project need etc all right and how big would these societies be Again, that would just depend on circumstance, but um, I think most people can agree that end stage communism, there would be a lot more localized production in that uh, we really would just by definition have to produce less than we do now. Um, I'm just uh, trying to figure out what localized means because a local is a little bit subjective in the sense that mm -hmm. you can have a community that's like a hundred people, like a very small town, yeah. and you can have, you could even have like a very heavily urbanized area. <laughs> Where, which is only like maybe two square miles, but it has a population of 10 million. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would argue that like there's not like an area definition, like, you know, this square mileage is local or whatever, but um, it's more in juxtaposition to like the global economy that we have now, or like the idea that in end stage communism, we would have to have one body determining the need of the entire globe or the entire I mean, nations wouldn't exist, but the entire quote-unquote nation of what the United States is today, that wouldn't, necessary, that wouldn't be necessary, in my opinion. I think that largely, in terms of very basic necessities, like, there would still be the technology of, like, freight and, like, imports, but it would probably be less used than it is now, because production 
in terms of basic necessities of like food, water, housing, et cetera, those things could be local and could be done by like cooperation within personal communication, if that makes sense. Okay, so what you're envisioning is that these individual communities would all be completely self-sufficient in terms of meeting their needs for, you know, basic things for survival? Uh, yeah, and I'm sure that there are geographical exceptions to that. And um, the answer that I would have to that would be the utilization of the freight technology if necessary. But again, I just think that it would go down on an aggregate scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to argue for your point, you could make the, you could make the argument that the geographical problem is no longer an issue simply because we have things like hydroponics, aeroponics, and vertical farms. Mm -hmm. So in theory, like literally anywhere can become a farm, even in orbit. Sure. But uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Like these individual self-sufficient communities would also trade with each other. Um, I don't see why not. I guess. I mean. It wouldn't even necessarily be an exchange, I don't think. I think that that kind of goes into sort of commodity production that's very characteristic of like market-based economies. I don't think it has to be a trade. I think that if there is a certain uh, geographical area that produces something that is needed in another geographical area, the fact that there is no longer a class society does not necessitate trade. Um, that being said, I don't see why like agreements aren't possible. Uh, but yeah the whole point is that there's cooperation there not necessarily like a bartering system mm -hmm. i'm just uh thinking that you already have the mechanisms that facilitate trade namely freight to move the goods and services across borders this could take the form of trains planes automobiles and uh, I'm little, those i'm a little ashamed that i use those terms but anyways yeah i, I mean those I mean. those technologies are like they're not means of trade by definition they're means of Transport. trade yeah means of transport yeah they like if things can be moved without needing to exchange then they're no longer means of trade they're just means of moving mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and what incentive is there for these communities to for lack of a better term uh trade with one another namely to like say one community is really really good at producing say food and the other mm -hmm. community is not as good so what incentive is there for the first community that's really good at growing food to give their excess crops to the less well uh, to the You're just talking about like comparative advantage, I guess. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the proper term. Yeah, and I mean, this goes into the, this is, I'm gonna give a similar answer to the argument that like theft would happen under like a kind of commune system, right? So like the idea is that if class is gone at this point you're talking about the state not being there and the state in marxist theory is a vehicle of class oppression uh if class no longer exists then you really don't have constructs there that go into the motive of hoarding and that go into the motive of theft so like when you have a society that overproduces food when measured against their population's need um then that society has absolutely no reason to hoard those resources. If those resources are going to waste, if everybody is well fed and you have like more whatever, more carrots, more potatoes, more whatever, though there's no reason for those those things to just rot or those things to go to households that aren't going to use them. There's really no structure there that would give motive to what you're saying. I mean, there actually is a very simple structure and that is that it's a lot simpler. I mean, in order to get a, say, a excess or, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on some words right now. In order to, uh, in order to get those carrots, those surplus mm -hmm. carrots over to the other community who wants them and has definitely communicated their want, you have to collect the carrots. You have to put them in a, say, a crate. In order for the new mm -hmm. transporter, you got to put it on the truck, and then you got to drive the truck, which of course requires fuel. That's going to require uh -huh. a lot of uh, effort on the part of the first community. Now, I mean, granted, it's not a lot of effort, but it's effort nonetheless, when in fact it would be a lot easier to simply let those carrots rot, use the rotted carrots as fertilizer, and then use that to grow yet more carrots. I mean, I'm just trying right. to figure out like what's their incentive for wanting to have those carrots over to uh, the other community. Because fundamentally, like, although I'm not an egoist, I do think 
uh, psychological egoism has a lot of point in that people are not motivated by altruism that they usually perceive no it's not altruism to... um yeah. it's not it's not about altruism um, um and my, my answer uh yeah sure go ahead yeah so i was just uh saying that like they're not going to be motivated by altruism which i'm glad we agree on makes mm -hmm. things a lot simpler actually it's going to be that like they need an incentive they need a reason like some benefit that they get for themselves to mm -hmm. give it to this other community sure um so the answer that i have for um the question of like need allocation and like um what's it called the the transport to like other communities i mean despite there being localized production the kind of div sorry my dog's in the background i don't know if you can hear that yeah, uh the <laughs> sorry I, i'll turn on push to talk if she keeps going but uh Basically, the um, now I'm blanking on words. Uh, Take your time. Like, I think that class society kind of impacts what is viewed as human nature at this point. So the like, there's nothing inherent to the human genome that has been found that really contributes to the oh my god I don't want to do effort to help this other community or whatever. It's and at the same time, though, this isn't me saying, like, we're going to socially engineer altruism. I think that there's the happy medium there of, first of all, you have, like, the benefit to yourself of, like, feeling that you've helped. That's what motivates people to do charity in the first place. But on top of that, you have had a need-based economy, and this is a really unsatisfying answer for a lot of people, but you've had a need-based economy for X amount of years to get from low-stage socialism to high-stage socialism. And the reason that that has caused society to no longer need the state right so i kind of preface this whole thing with the state's gone because the state was no longer needed if you run into that problem where society is like not exporting what needs to be exported to feed people then you're not at communism because there would still be need to be a state structure and a coercive structure there and if we never get to communism we never get to communism but if we are there then you can't make this claim anymore because we're at a society where people are already presupposed to be doing this transportation. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand your argument here. The mm -hmm. argument is that the existence of the system as it currently exists is what causes people to want to seek out benefits for themselves, and in the absence of it, people will... People will... Uh, people will have uh, the idea that they would need this incentive in the first place is simply unnecessary not quite i don't think that like all uh i don't want to call it egoism but i don't think that all like self-benefiting or individualist whatever uh is going to go away i do think that there is a psychological com component there on a very basic level of like benefiting yourself over others is kind of like a human survival thing in some cases but i think that what like the structures that like kind of breed sort of selfishness and kind of stomping on other people to get like um economic success now i think the structures that we have in place greatly exacerbate that uh and i don't think we would disagree on that either i think that a lot of things kind of um harness human nature for the worst uh in contemporary society so no, uh, short answer no. I don't think that like all is that like has to do with like benefiting yourself is um, socially constructed. But I think that in terms of economy and in terms of very basic helping of other people, I do think that in this end stage socialism, it would not be the problem that you're envisioning. Okay, so I'm just tr still trying to understand it. So basically, mm -hmm. we're going to the end end stage socialism will eventually find that self interest is no longer relevant. No, <laughs> uh, I think this goes into. I argue. I really don't know the contemporary position in like leftist circles, but like I argue that individual individualism and collectivism are not necessarily mutually exclusive in a lot of cases. Um, so that is. In, in cases like this, what is good for the collective is largely good for the individual. So it's not so much that it's totally gone, it's just that the circumstances surrounding the individual doesn't lead them to stomping on others or actively uh, 
neglecting the well-being of others in order to better themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, but the issue I see is that uh, people are going to be in these collectives for their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. After all, it's the mechanism by which they get food, they get water, they get all the stuff that they want. To some extent, yeah. So I just have trouble seeing what the benefit is to giving carrots to this other community if they expect to get nothing in return because ultimately it's the action is a net loss to the community which is ultimately a net loss to the individuals themselves you see lose, the problem the fuel, you lose the access to the truck for the time you lose the carrots you lose the box okay but you have to understand that those resources are by no law like the communities like that one and by that i don't mean like everybody i mean that, that like this one little sector right the only thing that I mean when I say localized production is that for the sake of efficiency and convenience in a lot of ways, a lot of production will only be distributed in a certain radius. But that doesn't mean that the means of production that are owned in what is like now, whatever, uh, New York City, are like that there theirs it's still ev like commonly owned by all of society so like them using a crate it's not like they're using new york's crate they're just using a crate to feed people so like kind of uh what's the word like um compartmentalizing the sort of motive of people into only small communities is kind of a fallacy in itself i think like the we're talking about like a full collective that just happens to have production on small scale in some sectors. It's not about like dividing at that point. But the reason that I treat it as the community's crate or the community's truck is because when it's used for the purpose of transporting it to someone to a different community, it's the community that it originates from is going to lose access to it. It's the problem. The of, it's a problem crate? of scarcity. It's not a problem of uh, property We rights. are talking about a post-scarcity society, you know? Yeah, post-scarcity society is going to be a rather separate issue. I mean, at that yeah. point, like, there's no... If you have a post-scarcity society, then ultimately there's no point in uh, trading this stuff at all, or trans trading or transporting a freight at all, since every community will be completely self-sufficient for anything that they could ever want. Uh... I mean, post-scarcity society is, uh, it's not necessarily on the local level. I mean, like, if, I, I mean, this is getting, like, a little more abstract, I guess, but, like, with presidents of innovation, I mean, I don't have any, like, uh, formal schooling in, like, agriculture or whatever, but, like, the there are geographic realities that can make, like, post-scarcity for a certain good impossible in one area. So, like, when people say post-scarcity, it is largely, like, an aggregate thing. That's the idea. I mean, so you're talking about post-scarcity only in certain commodities? No, I'm talking about, I'm saying that post-scarcity is meant to be a widespread phenomenon. Okay, and so, so post-scarcity of every good and service possible? I mean, obviously, um, there's a, obviously there's a middle ground, but the middle ground between, uh, there's, I mean, you're going to have to have like either post-scarcity for absolutely everything you could ever conceive of, or post-scarcity for goods and services that or for certain goods and services. Now that those certain goods and services could be a very wide breadth of items, but I mean when you move away from capitalism, you move from the sort of commodity fetishism that we have. I don't know if you've like read Marx. I'm not trying to like, you know, talk down or whatever, but like the there's like a the Marxist conception of commodity fetishism and commodity production and all these things render society like as almost um, like hoarders of commodities, right? And so once you move away from the commodity system, there are some things that are inherent to the commodity system that society just doesn't really need anymore. So like when you, that's why I'm like um, hesitant to say like, yes, every good in service uh, is post scarcity and there's no scarcity or whatever. Cause I don't think that, that some things are gonna be produced anymore, but I mean, I guess the easy answer would be, yeah, post-scarcity post is meant to be economy-wide. Yeah, so the the trick is that production, since, uh, I mean, I think we should hash out the definition of post-scarcity. I'll start out. So my definition of post-scarcity is infinite production, where you have 
every, every individual has infinite access to infinite everything? Uh, no, I don't think it's about infinity because I don't think infinite production is like even like a material reality. You're I right. think that it's abundance past the human need I and mean, abundance past the human want. So it's infinity for the intents of it doesn't end because like humans literally can't consume that much, but there's a limit physically. Like that's why I'm, I'm not trying to, I want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. Like it's, we're not saying like we're going to have like without utilizing or without creating like endless farmland we're somehow going to produce endless food that's not the point mm -hmm. the the point is that there will be more food than is like needed and you just kind of go from there it's the same thing for every good or service i mean the reason i say that it has to be infinite production is because fundamentally human wants are infinite I don't agree. I mean, this has been demonstrated, and you can see this everywhere, where individuals like might have a very excellent quality of life, but eventually they tire of that and start demanding something more. Yeah, I think we touched on this yeah, we yesterday. Did. Yeah, um, we did. Just, are we getting off topic before I respond, do you think? like? Uh, I mean, I think we've kind of gotten off topic from the very beginning, but that's fine because, uh, I mean, this is just the way things go. But okay. Anyway, but anyway, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, so you were going to say something in reply to that? Yeah, and then I think we probably should get more on track. I don't know. If I say something you like seriously have an issue with, then like, yeah, respond, but whatever. Um, basically, I don't think, like, the easy ones to refute that is that, like, human, assuming stable population, human necessity is finite. It doesn't grow forever. Um, like, with food there's a such thing as like there's a biological mechanism of being full and etc cetera, etc cetera. like people just don't need food or water after a certain point before you know digestion all of the nice biological functions we have um so by definition those things are finite would you agree with that uh, not entirely because well one the presence of obesity indicates that people are willing to eat more than they actually need and secondly, any sure. situation that has that can meet the food needs of an entire population is going to be experiencing population growth, which if you continuously what yeah. why does it necessitate that a well-fed population necessitates a growing population? Well, yeah, I mean, eventually people are have eventually people are going to have hatchlings. Uh, yeah, but you realize that a couple has to have like three children to actually result in a growth from their part right yeah and given that society is able to meet the food needs of everyone in society it wouldn't be terribly difficult for them to do so uh i mean most We're contemporary not... like statistics would disagree like more well-off societies in the modern day they tend not to replace like even replace themselves meaning their total fertility rate is lower than two so that like it actually becomes a problem especially in like south korea and japan these countries that are very well developed and in terms of like um i guess stability there's no like serious health crisis happening right mm -hmm. so you would think by your logic that since they're secure they should just be like you know pumping out babies right but they're not like there's i don't think there's any serious scientific way to say that prosperity like inevitably leads to pro population growth i mean that's a very in complicated fact, issue because the yeah it reason, is I, but i mean like that... the less prosperous places have like a fertility rate of like six or seven in a lot of cases so mm -hmm. it's very difficult because uh in europe like there's a crap ton of social and uh, political issues that can be argued to be what's keeping a population down but i'm just speaking in general it's like historical time or historically like we've experienced baby booms especially like after mm -hmm. world war ii which was a time of massive prosperity in the united states and you can see this reflected in like times of massive economic booms all across the developed world i mean Currently, yeah like, i i japan, think that this is really branching off now because like branching off but i mean i just thought i'd address it real quick yeah i mean that goes into like women empowerment reproductive rights the whole different career structure that we had back then the different economy 
yeah like the, 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 the point i'm just trying to make is that fundamentally like even for things even with things that have hard biological limits on the amount of stuff that any individual is able to consume you're still going to necessarily trend towards infinite production being absolutely necessary uh, okay but then you're sort of backpedaling because before if that were true you wouldn't have needed to have brought up the idea that people are producing more than as in like reproducing more than replacement rate right so I, I don't know I guess I'm a little confused like you're saying that it doesn't matter like the population growth doesn't matter because by definition like human wants are infinite but if that's the case why did you bring up population growth in the first place i don't think i said population growth doesn't matter i use population growth as an example of how things how certain commodities with certain biological limits on the amount of food that people can consume will still trend towards infinity I mean, your people. Are gonna, Why? Another example is like I just mentioned, population growth is one example. Another one is just like if you give everybody houses, eventually they're going to start demanding either more larger houses or a combination of both. If you start uh, giving everyone's uh, needs for, say, consumer consumer entertainment, they're going to start demanding more of it. And they're gonna Why do you? What do you varieties. base this on? This is like a very. This is a claim that would need like meta analyses. This is, this, is, some, this is something that you can observe even in your own life. You can just, there's a reason that people still aren't playing the same video games that they weren't playing in, say, 1998. I mean, sure, you can find some people who are into retro gaming, but for the most part, like, that's, the, that's a niche group, not the mainstream. You can also find people who, throughout the, who over the course of their life in what you would call capitalist society, as their earnings increase over the course of their lifetime, they'll move for, they'll move into larger and larger housing spaces. Now, do they need a McMansion? I mean, fundamentally, that's up to the individual to decide for themselves. But I mean, you I would imagine you would argue that no, they don't need uh, five thousand square feet of living space for. Yeah, and it's it's just really unscientific what you're saying right now. Like you're not accounting like you mentioned to me that I'm not accounting for the various variables in like Europe and their population mm-hmm. rates, but you're not accounting for the variables of like environment today. So if you like view people in capitalist society wanting more material wealth and you're like, oh, look, <laughs> this is what people are like, like there's a problem there. The problem is that we're within an economy that fetishizes commodities for one, meaning they kind of create this like, um, idea I, like martin luther king talked about it in some speech as well like this idea that like uh once you have a bigger house or you have like a nicer looking game it's suddenly better that is a largely new concept for like the masses right like the idea that faster car equals better car bigger house equals better house that's not a concept that's ingrained in human nature and to make a claim like that requires extraordinary evidence that you've not presented it's simple observable reality the only reason that it exists as a relatively recent phenomenon is because this prosperity this ability to even acquire it is a relatively (laughs) recent phenomenon in human history i mean you had the middle ages like these larger houses the this uh, abundance of food just wasn't available Again, this is speculation, though. It's like you're it's really you're not. speculating you're speculating that this is ingrained in human nature, where there hasn't there haven't really been studies on that. <laughs> there haven't been like, as far as I know, unless you can link me one, I'm not going to make an objective claim. I haven't read every study on the face of the earth, but you're making a claim that isn't just like, oh, I logic my way here. You have to have empirical evidence for that. The idea that like controlling for every society for all environmental factors that can be controlled. Like, people will still have this need of material growth on a level of, um, what's the word? Like, I guess the problem is that success or material growth is subjective to what society deems that. So, like, on at face value, the, um, like, a bigger house objectively isn't better than a smaller house if the smaller house has also has a kitchen, bedrooms, or whatever, for a family of the same size, right? 
like the only reason that it's better to someone is because it demonstrates that you have more material success you have more money or you have more whatever those things are all socially constructed and i don't think you can really argue against that okay so you admit that the so you agree with me that uh value is subjective no what <laughs> sorry i was just uh taking that aside anyways nice little one-liner for your subscribers <laughs> well yeah uh, enjoy it no that is not that is a very different economic conversation that stems from a misunderstanding of what Marx meant by his definition of value, I think. Um, but the the question of like what is deemed as success is in itself socially constructed. And I think we can agree on that. You can just see that in a lot of things. Like there were times where like when kings were like very, very overweight, it was it was just a demonstration of their divine right to rule because they deserve this like you know abundance of food and now we view it as like you are unhealthy you don't know how to choose you are unsuccessful you're irresponsible whatever it's just there are plenty of examples historically of where the definition of success or what demonstrates success has changed i guess that's the only point i really need to make here so and again we're getting off track <laughs> i don't know man i'm just i'm not sure i've kind of lost place like what was this about the idea of infinite wants right right so yeah so i mean you've kind of demonstrated my point that people's wants are going to change over time and eventually they're going to start wanting more and more i mean you're, no, you can already see this in the sense that uh you can already see this in the sense that our level of technology and our level of uh, <clears throat> What's available has increased to the point where even the poor of today have better lifestyles than the monarchs of old. And if people didn't otherwise want that, then it wouldn't have been made available. And this is no, going we're by the living... logic of a market. That's just going by the logic of a market economy, let alone a capitalist one. Yeah, capitalist economy. Uh, Go ahead. Fundamentally, you can't convince people to do something that's. I lost my train of thought there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, capitalist economy, I think we agree on this, I hope, like has to grow, right? It can't stagnate. Once it stagnates, it collapses. It's like a shark in that manner. Like it's uh, based on the model of economic growth. So I mean, the I idea of capitalism is it's a uh, the etymology, okay, market the economy. Then I, yeah, I don't know. The problem with uh, the term capitalist is that its entomology is very vague and ambiguous it's very difficult to have a conversation about capitalism when everybody has a completely different definition some people will say it's the private ownership of the means of production for profit some people will omit the for-profit part altogether okay some well to avoid that exchange. then can we agree market economy then sure. like okay like allocation based on the model of supply and demand etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. um that depends on growth do we agree on that I don't think so. So like that, like the whole thing where, like the business cycle, like the idea of like perpetual economic growth over time, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just the nature of, I think that's the nature of any technological development. And I think the ex existence of economic growth is illustrative of my point of infinite wants. Another example that demonstrates no. infinite want is the existence of immigration. Mm, what? Why? Because people are going out of their way to try to seek a better life for themselves because they want more than what they already have. Or their countries were artificially impoverished, but that's yet another conversation that we could have on yet another day. Uh, uh, there's immigration in between, even between countries that are quote-unquote artificially impoverished and even in places that aren't artificially impoverished, there's immigration between, say, United in the United States. I mean, I'm living in Texas, and I see people all the time who are moving here from California. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there's no war or exploitation going on in California. It's just that the economy is stagnant for reasons that are different from the scope of this conversation. But the point is uh -huh. that people are leaving because they perceive a net benefit to themselves and they want more than what they already have in California. No, I would say that 
again, we're arguing from the perspective of a person living in this society that we have. And I don't blame you for doing that, but you have to understand that you are talking to somebody who wants to kind of break the mold and get out of what we're in. So like, I don't know. Uh, the So one thing that you said that I take serious issue with is the idea that economic growth is somehow demonstrative of like infinite human want. I don't agree with that. I think that a lot of demand is largely manufactured in a lot of ways and i think that assuming this is also going into the problem of overproduction which has okay. been a thing since Can I just the say something onset real quick? of sorry to interrupt um, uh, no let me finish please um the so the idea that all capital somehow gets used or allocated to an existing human want is in itself a snuck premise that you would have to defend in another conversation probably uh it, it just sounded like you cut off there are you finished and uh, yeah, I'm finished. Did you catch it all? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I was just uh, okay. you, it just sounded like you cut off abruptly. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So I mean, I think I've demonstrated my point about in about uh, not economic demand, but want being infinite because it will necessarily trend towards infinity, and as such, in order to achieve post scarcity, you would necessarily have to accomplish a level of production that simply does not exist within the known laws of physics. To be clear, and I don't mean to be hostile, no, you have not <laughs> demonstrated that point. You have effectively said that based on empirical observation in studies that you have not provided, people are within the current society not accounting for uh, environmental factors, may be keen on wanting more material like wealth. I mean, you haven't you, demonstrated anything about human nature. Do you, d do you deny that immigration is happening? No, immigration happens. Do you deny that immigration happens for the reasons I described? That what people push want, factors? That that's pretty not, not just vague. push not just push factors, but also because they want more than what they have. And also, even with push factors, it's because people are leaving because they don't want to be pushed. They're not satisfied with being pushed. No they push want to be uh, pushed. No push factor is just like a term, like in economics, like um, there are. Um, like immigration push factors means things that kind of push you to immigrate. I don't, I don't know. It's a weird term. Um, and I don't know them off the top of my head. Maybe we could look it up at some point, but like, um, no, I mean, the reasons are usually economic. I don't deny that, but I mean, in that you, case, it you still kind of have doesn't, to, you can you would have to acknowledge that the human wants are going to trend towards infinity no you again are like extrapolating the idea of someone within a capitalist society within an economy that depends on growth like moving towards like a higher salary for for example that you're saying that that can be extrapolated to human nature no it can't <laughs> by definition it can't i'm sorry to like focus on this point but you're saying like i have demonstrated you haven't and I just want to make that clear. Like the point that you're making, like I don't know if you know the saying, "Outrageous claims require outrageous element uh, evidence." Please provide it. I guess. Like I, there would have to be. I, I've there would have to be. Meta. I've given no, you've given like you very. Observe. No, you've given very faulty logic applying only to the current society and not accounting for environmental factors. Like the whole point of the scientific method, the whole point of scientific experimentation is that you control for the environment right? What you're saying is people within capitalism do capitalistic things. No shit. <laughs> but like you haven't demonstrated that within a system without commodity production, without market allocation, etc. Like there's no, you haven't demonstrated that those people would still trend towards infinite, if infinite wants in general. Okay. I don't, I mean, I don't know if you, you want are, to move on. I mean, you are correct. I'll give you that you are correct that I have not demonstrated that people in a uh, non-commodity production society will trend will have their wants trend towards infinity that is correct however uh -huh. in that case i think the burden of proof shifts because now you're making a positive claim what that people that they won't t yeah. trend towards infinity yeah i mean like uh i haven't seen any examples of a stateless classless moneyless society on earth where people's wants did not increase um well i mean it largely hasn't existed in economic record like there have been like very primitive ones that we can't really account for but like the question of like 
whether wants would continue. I think you have to look at like the source of growing want within capitalism. And again, um, I want to make this part clear: if we don't get if we don't get to a point where a state isn't required to curb this, then we don't, and we have to stay in high stage socialism. Just to be clear, like if com if what you're saying, if I grant you everything that you said, and we can't attain communism it has no bearing on socialism just to make that clear but Fair i don't enough. grant you everything you've said um the idea that goes in to like people moving from california to texas because i don't know they're a lawyer and there's a law firm that pays them thirty thousand dollars in real dollars more in the texas city than in the california city or whatever um that in itself has to do with class mobility which is a largely well it's a construct of class society and capitalism which is um uniquely um what's the word uh it's unique in that in theory bold italics in theory people are able to move to the next class and so you have this vision we call it the american dream here i'm sure there are other terms elsewhere uh where you if you just work hard enough can make it to the next class and so every dollar that you make extra is a kind of result of that mindset i don't know all right so i'm just trying to be uh tie this up a little bit here so you do agree that at least under a market economy that people's wants are going to trend towards infinity i'm just not sure why that would change in the absence of a market economy of a commodity based production system um i would say that within a market economy that like demand is manufactured towards infinity i don't think it has anything to do with the inherent wants uh demand but, demand or want because those are two different things um i mean economic demand in the fact of like in the model of um resource allocation i mean i will admit that a lot of demand is manufactured through central banking uh, artificially inflating asset bubbles but beyond that it's like all economic demand is want plus affordability i mean people can want a lot of things uh, they can afford it. no not in i mean i don't know if there are multiple definitions but not in contemporary like economic thought like one of the aspects of demand one of the shift factors of demand is the real income of consumers which goes into the affordability aspect so in that sense demand sort of is just like an aggregate want i guess it's it's it's, it's want it's, plus the ability to afford it otherwise uh, I, there's no point in demand curves yeah but I mean, this that's funny, what I'm... this is the funny thing about uh, post scarcity economy i mean once you've achieved post scarcity you don't really need uh, a planned economy at all because everything is something that everyone could always want. Everything. I think I said can that. You poorly. rephrase that. Yeah, yeah. I said that very poorly. Like everything is available, so there's really no point to uh, figuring out how resources need to be allocated. Um. There is still production. I, I don't really understand your point. The point is that everything is available to everyone at every, at every point in time. Uh huh. So, therefore, like the point of economics is to figure out how to distribute scarce resources. When you don't have scarcity, the point of economics is, well, economics becomes pointless and it's just an act of vanity <laughs> I, I mean i guess that's pretty uh, that's an abstract thing to say i guess uh, I, I tend to be pretty abstract if that's uh, annoying i do apologize but no you're good i yeah. mean i also don't think it has much bearing on this like the probably not but i mean we wouldn't really need to have such exhaust exhaustive um measurements of I guess resources in order to um, allocate them efficiently. I guess not so much anyway. But again, abstract, probably beyond the scope of this conversation, and you know, mm -hmm. etc. So, anyways, uh, I'd like to segue back to the original topic on the uh, <laughs> on a planned economy. Sure. So, I mean, like from what you described, 
it mm-hmm. very much sounds like a just a business to me only without the incentive for exchange can you elaborate on that so you have an organization which produces resources for itself and for others around it and however you have gotten rid of specialization in the sense like you have one group that's really good at creating apples another group that's really good at creating beds and then they exchange their apples for beds and of course things become more complex and you have a you have to develop a medium of exchange this is basically what i'm describing a market economy i mean it just sounds like what you're describing is a market economy except with uh well the whole point is that there's a difference in allocation like when you when you say something is a market economy <clears throat> excuse me um when you say something is a market economy um you're making a claim about allocation mostly um with the whole supply and demand model uh that's what a planned economy is juxtaposed to. We kind of abolish the allocation of supply and demand and instead supply based on measured need, uh, just based on efficiency in a lot of ways. How do you measure need? Um, I mean, in the past, it's been done in much more exhaustive bureaucratic ways, but now with the um, the very far um, like reach of algorithms and... Um, there was a, a project in like Chile, I think, I forget what it was called, Cyber, Cyber Sin or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's Cyber Sin. Um, like, and I think that went into like algorithms for like measuring things like this, but I really haven't read too far in it. I, I don't know, that was just like a little side comment. Um, the answer is it depends in a lot of cases, but it is very conceivable that it can be done and it is largely done now, actually. Um, so you can view in a lot of cases, um, you can view a business like as its own tiny little um, command economy, and I'm stealing that from someone else, by the way. Like someone else had said that at some point. That's uh, fine. Like That's a, fine. a a business can it it allocates its resources based on corporation does it based on a board of directors, and you go down the business organizational chain, um, and that despite being done for the purposes of a supply and demand model is done through planning you have projections you have actuaries uh, financial planners who are measuring the expected demand and so you take those methods and you change it you change what you're measuring you use the same methods for different um, values which is how many people do you have uh, what is the caloric intake maybe of the average individual and then you can create a range based on that based on statistical data um, this is just food production there are of course different methods for other areas um, etc I guess uh, I don't know I don't want to go on for too long um, but it would depend on the country and it would depend on the sector of the economy I guess the difference is that with a business they have they're incredibly specialized <laughs> and they also receive inputs that a command economy would simply lack. Uh, what do you mean by that? One moment, please. Someone just joined, and I want to make sure that they don't interrupt us. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, anyways, like I'm pretty sure you've heard of the economic calculation problem. Ah, crap! He left. That's actually worse. <laughs> She's gonna try to make a lot of Discord noises. Do you want to like pause? Maybe I don't know. Uh. I mean, just. I'm just gonna go ahead and ban him from the debates chat. <laughs> I mean, it's a little excessive, but I'll I'll remove the ban when it's uh. Yep, there it is. And. There we go. We good? Let me just uh, move him real quick. There we go. We did it, Reddit. I mean, that's just... Uh... Yep, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, repeat. Economic calculation. You said sorry. Problem. Yeah, the big problem Am I aware that... of it? I don't agree with the premises behind it. <laughs> but the basic but issue, is that the issue is that in order to really, like, the best way to quantify 
to quantify uh, need in your terms is to uh, figure out economic demand. And economic demand simply works on a price system. Without prices, well, you're at best, you're just, it's just guesswork. I mean, you can't exchange with yourself, so you don't know how many of your computers is worth, I don't know, a roll of tape. Why do I have a roll of tape on my desk? Anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, this kind of goes into the Marxist con conception of value that I'm sure we don't agree on. Uh, uh, I don't know, like, the... First of all, no, you would not measure it in the contemporary economic demand. I'm not a market socialist, so that's just my position. Um, market demand is largely based on price now, um, and is quantity demanded is largely influenced by price. So the no, uh, and that's what I said before. The you would take the same methods of measuring economic demand that we have, sort of actuary um, and statistics, science, things like that. Um, and you don't apply them to the same thing. You're not measuring the same thing, but the methods stay the same. So, and this, and I alluded to this with the range. So, I, if I remember correctly, um, I get the Austrian shit mixed up, to be honest. But uh, the economic calculation problem also deals with the premise that value is subjective. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to agree with it by definition, but I mean to answer uh, the. Of course, people are going to need, on a very basic level, more calories than another person, etc., uh, based on just human biology, um, genetics, things like that. Um, and that's why you create a range, which is what I alluded to in my answer to how things would be planned. Um, so um, there have been examples of this that I don't have on hand, uh, but like, just in general, like dietary science, where like it's you're never given like a set amount of calories that you need or you shouldn't be by any credit like credible person uh it's like a, if you're a certain weight range you could consume this amount of calories generally don't apply that necessarily to like on a very individual dietary plan but on an aggregate scale etc and you apply that logic to most goods and services like you create an acceptable range that tries to include every um unavoidable unavoidable biological or other uh, scenario. All right, I'm just still not sure, like, why is it that uh, you're kind of actually affirming the subjective theory of value in the sense that individuals, like different individuals are gonna have different need, different caloric needs, different uh, dietary needs or preferences. Something that might be very healthy for someone might just like give someone else the runs. Yeah, and, and I uh, think I said this earlier, I think the subjective theory of value, it's not based on lies, I'm not saying that, but it's based, it doesn't refute anything, because it's not, like, it's it's not a refutation of the Marxist conception of value, because it's, well, we don't... It's, it's, it's a refutation of a classical theory of value, which argued that value was objective, and the classical economists, like, just wrote themselves into circles, just, like, trying to figure out, like, how it is that you could have one person valuing a certain item more or less than another individual like they it just boggled their minds like they couldn't figure it out yeah and the marxist conception of value doesn't really go into that personal marginalistic value like that's that's always the weird thing i mean i to be fair like i haven't um I'm not as well read as I would like to be on Austrian and Chicago at schools of economics um i'm a little biased in that manner but uh from what I understand, it doesn't really, it doesn't have much bearing on the Marxist conception of value because the Marxist conception of value has little to do with like consumption, I guess. You assume that if a, a product of labor is useful to someone, then that is useful labor and can therefore be measured in value. So any, and this goes into like the useless labor. So if I spend like uh, five hours trying to build like I don't know a violin and the violin just doesn't work and it doesn't make any sound or whatever then that's a useless object and I've wasted my time and there's no reason to try to put value to it because no one can use it right um, but if you have a useful object useful to anybody a coat maybe of course someone in Florida is probably not going to need that coat in like July but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that the 
uh, measurement of value in the Marxist conception is different in Florida than it is from New York. It just means that it, that point is irrelevant. Like, and that's what that's what I think is good about the Marxist conception of value is that it like kind of ignores those variables because it, it really doesn't have much to do with them. It just has to do with labor, and. Yeah, I don't know. I'm ranting. I have a tendency to rant, and I apologize. Um, You're fine. Uh, short answer, though, this goes into like economic um, planning and moving of resources to other communes if you don't need them. Um, it's just that a co if a coat is useful to someone, it has that use value in it, and the labor put into it is what creates its value. And but so it has nothing to do with the subjectivism of like personal want. But if we've achieved uh, post-scarcity, there's no reason to uh, ship goods from one commune to another. More importantly, like so far, you haven't demonstrated that they would even want to do this out in the first place, since we both agree that it would be it would be uh, they wouldn't want to do it out of altru out of pure altruism. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's like if we operate on the premise like i think i'm repeating myself a little but so what yeah no it's uh, no problem um then if we achieve post-scarcity then the exchange then the transportation would be completely <laughs> unnecessary in the first place thus the only reason that the shipping of goods would happen in the first place is because one the people who are doing the shipping seek to gain some value out of it and two because go goods are not scarce and there is an abundance in one area to meet a deficit somewhere else okay you're doing the thing again where like you're separating like um, sort of motive by community. Uh, so, like, taking the example of the code again, if you say we're in a post scarcity society, therefore the materials that go into coats and therefore coats are post scarcity and abundance by definition, then you're the idea that you're confining the resources to community is kind of contradictory. So, what I mean by that is if the resources are in Florida to make coats or whatever I, I don't know what goes into coat production like wool or whatever um, cotton uh, like the if those resources are abundant um, that goes into aggregate post scarcity and so if the New York commune for simple terms uh, is s scarce quote unquote on on coats then they utilize the abundance of aggregate resources to have coats shipped to them that's that's my point. But why would the Florida commune give coats to the New York commune if the Florida commune won't get anything in return? I mean, there's again, this there's nothing that suggests that they don't. I think this was like the first thing we touched on with like the trade thing. I mean, um, I so far haven't gotten any satisfactory explanation as to why it is that the why self-interest of economic actors suddenly goes away in the absence of commodity production. I don't think it goes away. I just think that the self-interest manifests itself differently in a classless society. So what I mean by that is like, um, if you have a society that has like absolutely no class, absolutely no, uh, and therefore no ruling class to have state coercion, um, you then kind of assume that many of the motives that go into theft and hoarding kind of go away. You don't get economic gain from it because they won't be used by your society. There's no reason not to, essentially. And if you're going to go into the... Um, I mean, I already, what's it called? I already explained why you wouldn't ship it because it's too much trouble. Yeah, and that's what I'm going into. So if you're going to go into the um, effort point of, like, you know, labor would go into it, that just goes into, like, jobs, uh, and the which is kind of a point of disagreement in my opinion, among like a lot of leftists, like wh what kind of happens to work in communism. But uh, as I understand it, um, there will still be people who operate freight. And like, this is still going to be a thing that people do. And so it won't be like a matter of the entire commune is going to have an uptick in the effort that needs to be expended. It's just going to be a difference in where they ship, etc. I don't know. But why do they ship? What? I just... What do you mean? Why do they ship? Why do people exist that ship? Or... Because I just answered, like... You answered that they would ship. I'm still trying to figure I, out... I'm still trying to understand the motive for why a commune would ship in the first place. Again, so 
the way you're viewing it is there you're separating and maybe this is my fault for separating new york and florida in the first place but you're separating the effort like whatever measurement of effort between florida and everyone else uh so first of all i think that's a problem if you're going to have like a measure of like aggregate motive then i would say do it in an actual aggregate um but within florida and within any commune the um sorry just go to pm uh within any um commune the there will still be people that have tasks and jobs and so there would be people who are um shipping freight or preparing freight anyway so there wouldn't be a larger expenditure of effort that's the point i was trying to make before I was still I'm I'm still having trouble understanding. Like I can understand like maybe why people from New York would would uh, go through the trouble of going driving down taking the excess uh, mm -hmm. sweaters or coats that Florida has and then taking them back up because they're trying to fulfill an uh, was fundamentally an economic demand. But even then, it's like there's still going to be a there's still going to be a scarcity. I mean, I just don't see what the why Florida, why people in Florida would do it beyond pure altruism. I mean, for the sake of argument, if you just want to go with the other model that you presented, that New York just does the work for the things that it, its area needs, then I mean, go ahead. Because, mm -hmm. like, again, we're talking about an abstract society where, I don't know, um, I think, is there a name for a fallacy? I don't, I'm not saying you're committing it, but it's common in discussions like this when anyone has a sort of, like, new society that they want to build people can like try to create a problem and the answer is not going to be satisfactory because we're not actually faced with the problem yet so like i i don't have a concrete answer for everything i guess yeah but um, i think the problem is that the hypothetical as proposed is impossible not in the sense that like we can't that it would be completely improbable that a late that a late stage communist society wouldn't form as you described it it's just that the I, there's still no motive i can see for people to want to ex people to want to give goods and services to each other without getting some service in return like they would have to either be directed by some uh central authority to do so under threat or they would have there would have to be some incentive for them to do so in the first place either because the central authority pays them to do it which of course begs another question like where do they get the resources to do that or they would have to get something from their bartering partner and for example, like uh, New York might be really good at creating, I don't know, lawn chairs or like <laughs> better yet, beach chairs. And because yeah. beaches in New York are absolute garbage. I mean, <laughs> I mean have you ever been to uh, New York? I haven't been to the beaches. <laughs> oh, well, try the Long Island Sound sometime and you will learn what a crappy beach is. But anyways, yeah, like, so say New York is really good at making lawn or beach chairs. What they do uh -huh. is they sell it to Florida for the, uh, for the coats and fundamentally both parties benefit. Yeah, so the reason I was very hesitant to say, like, yeah, trade will exist is because I don't want to, in the off chance that, like, I don't even know if, did you say this was going somewhere on YouTube or something? Uh, um, yes, it is. Yeah, so on the off chance that some like left communist hears me and they hear me like allude to like commodity production, then they flip their shit. Like, I just want to be like clear. I mean, that I wouldn't worry um, too much about uh, what they think. Just try like, to focus on what you. No, believe. but like what I'm saying though is like I I try to be really like specific with these things, and it kind of like it screws me over in the long run. But like the um. There would not, I don't think, be a trade system because that necessitates commodity production, which I would say is um, uh, integral to market economy or the very beginning stages of post-market economy. What I do think is perhaps, and there is this goes into um, maybe ethics philosophy, I don't know, uh, that there would be a social structure of we provide for others needs when our needs are met because that happens to us as well so it's not quite a trade it's like this like society runs because we do this and i mean there are like little examples of this even in low socialist societies it's like really small things that are anecdotal so take them for what they're worth but like uh there was like this one story i'm stealing this from someone else too um 
like where in the Soviet Union there were like these uh, soda machines or something, and in the soda machines there would be like these glasses, and like you could just steal the glass, like you anyone could, anyone could take it and just leave. Um, but like it, like really never happened because like money was such a so differently characterized, even in such a low stage socialist society that like theft of it just wouldn't make sense. Like why even do it? So like it's I don't know. I mean, it's, it's again it's, abstract society demands abstract answers i think what you're describing is a sort of a mutual aid society uh i don't well, like, want would you prefer a, a gift-based economy no <laughs> um what i'm and again i'm not saying that this is necessarily what would happen i'm just like giving a possibility because again and i hate using this because it feels like a cop-out even when i say it but it's true if you're assuming that we're at a point where there is no longer a state then you also assume that people are operating under communism willingly so like just keep that in the back of your mind oh, for like every answer i give um anyway the I, I'm not making the concrete claim that there absolutely would be some kind of um, sense of obligation because society would do the same for you. I'm not saying that's necessarily true. I'm just saying that that's a possibility that would drive people to that. I think you would still have a form of trade. It's just that it's trade with a few extra steps. I mean, it's I guess like, you could maybe make that argument. I mean, it's just sort of like you... You have, back to the New York and Florida example, Florida sells their, but by for, for by, let's not use sell, uh, they give their, they give their coats to New York, mm -hmm. and they don't expect anything in return, but then uh, New York gives their beach chairs to Florida, and so trade occurs except instead of trading in goods and services, you're trading on the expectations of getting something in return. You give yeah, something to Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, like, semantics. Semantics, it's, there wasn't, like, necessarily an agreement there that they would get X amount of lawn chairs no, or beach chairs no. to, like, I, I don't know. I guess that goes into, like, the definition of trade, which I don't know off the top of my head. So I, I can... It, I, 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 I would just... It, yeah, ahead. what you're just describing is just trade with a few extra steps. I don't know, maybe. Uh, what I was maybe alluding to is there was like some paper in some philosophy course I took that like uh, talked about like the possibility of like objective morality, which is a very different conversation. But basically, the point that they were making was that like we don't murder people not just because of like law, but because like there is a sort of social evolutionary thing there where people don't murder in cold blood because they don't want to be murdered in cold blood and it's like a very subconscious deep down thing that's all that's all that really led me to this thought process i'm really just theorizing at this point because communism despite it being a very rich ideology with many different developments we don't have a blueprint we don't have a blueprint for like what comes next we only know like the very rough uh what we view to be inevitability that the workers will kind of um, grow tired of the antagonisms and mm -hmm. sort of kinda, try to move to a classless society. I kind of like, and I might be using the wrong name here, I'm kind of terrible with names, but I like Bakunin's idea of the, mm -hmm. voluntary, yeah, of the voluntary communism where you don't need to have a centrally planned like, socialist system in order to achieve it. And that what he argued, and this got him co kicked out of the Communist International for, is that a state is going to perpetuate its own existence and that mm -hmm. it's never going to get to a late stage of a stateless, classless, moneyless society, mostly because you're just yeah. going to have people in power who are going to justify their own power and existence. I mean, I mean that... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do like it. A lot of anarcho-communists like it. Um, I view it as idealistic in a lot of ways. Uh, in that I don't think that it's possible like not even speaking on his comments on like self-perpetuation of the state uh, that doesn't even really matter it's kind of irrelevant because I don't think communism is attainable right out of the gate like I don't think that we could get like especially by definition of post-scarcity we aren't there now like we have the means to get there now but we aren't the vast reorganization in my opinion that would be required is just not something you can do in my opinion without um a sort of uh like middle phase there but that gets into intercommunist debates <laughs> that yeah 
I, mean, I don't know. I guess the best question to ask is, uh, how many more years would the Soviet Union have had to exist before they went anarchist? Um, it would have to be worldwide. That's generally agreed upon. How many years? I mean, how many years would the worldwide Soviet <laughs> Union have uh, had to endure for before it achieved anarchism? I, I don't know. The, like there would there may be some complex way to measure that, but I am not a supercomputer. <laughs> well, I, don't uh, think, I don't think we need a supercomputer. I mean, I was I have a, another friend who is a uh, who is an ANCOM, but. I mean, the same question was posed to him, and he realized that, uh, yeah, having a central government that controls everything is just not going to 